So the question says, a bug flying horizontally. Okay, let me just start by, I'm just going to doodle a little bit so that I have um, kind of, I can make sure that I'm reading the question the way I, so the flying horizontally at some speed of V collides and sticks to the end of a uniform rock, uniform stick hanging vertically. Okay, so I have some stick that's hanging vertically. Um, after the impact, the so the stick with the dead bug on it, um, it swings out to some maximum angle theta. This angle theta from the vertical before rotating back. If the mass so okay so they are not giving me any numbers but um, there's some symbol for the mass of the bug and the question is saying the mass of this stick is 10 times that uh, of the bug calculate the okay calculate the length of the stick um, if uh, you know after reading this question it, it's puzzling you you feel like uh, you haven't been given all the information. I think that's perfectly valid. Um, the thing that I think is really amazing about physics as a discipline is that the kind of the problem solving methods that we have, it allows you to really reason and uh, calculate from limited amount of information. Um, in other sciences, what sometimes we call stamp collecting, you get a huge amount of data over which you don't need all of. Um, in physics, really, the the sign of a skillful physicist is someone who needs a minimal set of information to work out a salient uh, point of an interaction. So as you are looking at question like this, uh, we are now late enough in the semester where um, you have a lot of problem solving tools in your toolbox. You have a standard strategy, you have kinematics, you have... And of all those tools, what I would say is should be your first to go to are conservation laws. And um, the reason conservation laws are the first things that I would ask you to consider applying in any problem solving is that uh, they are easy to apply. And one, <laughs> and two, they are easy to rule out. In situations where they don't apply, uh, it's easy for you to look for particular features of interaction and say quickly that, oh, this conservation law doesn't apply, let's move on. Because uh, uh, a lot of general problem solving techniques, they end up being kind of trial and error. So the thing, the kind of technique I want you to develop is how to fail quickly or how to try something quickly to know if it will work and then move on if it doesn't. So here, um, with the conservation laws, one of the things that's nice is that you have exactly three quantities that can be conserved. Uh, you could have conservation of energy. It's a possible quantity to be conserved. You have conservation of momentum. That's another possible quantity to be conserved. And since last week, you have conservation of angular momentum. That's the third. And last of quantities that could possibly be conserved in physics 4A. And I guess if you want you to mess, but <laughs> whatever. Um, energy momentum, angular momentum. Those are the three things you should consider. So uh, with each of these, we should uh, consider this interaction carefully and see if uh, these quantities are conserved. Um, I think it's relatively easy to rule out energy conservation. Um, it, as you are reading the question carefully, it says sticks to the end of a uniform stick. Uh, and this is, sticks is an uh, important part. I hope that the phrase sticking reminds you of completely inelastic collision, where um, most of the possible kinetic energy is lost, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. So based on that, I'm going to rule out conservation of energy, that the way this interaction works, at least for the collision part, conservation of energy wouldn't work. Now, as I'm looking ahead to the swing up part here, I can I will say, oh yeah, energy should be conserved here. Um, this is kind of like your ballistic pendulum uh, lab. So where it asks about the momentum, and this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, you have to be, uh, you have to remember under what conditions momentum is conserved. 
So if you watch through the lecture, the condition where momentum is conserved is when um, net external force is zero. Or, you know, in, in the lecture, we had a bit of a refinement about the, the thing that we care being the impulse due to the net external force. So as you visualize this interaction, where I want to bring your attention to is this pivot point that's holding the stick. And um, I, I think it's good to have this imagination of um, you know, how the stick would move if it wasn't being held here at all, that, and how it does move given that stick is um, it, it's being fixed at this point. And if you have an intuition that those two motions would look different, then that's good intuition. I want to encourage that. And yeah, they're going to look different. And because of that, I am going to say at this pivot point, there is some kind of a pivot force that will impact, um, that will be, so that pivot force will be our net external force. That's also going to be imparting some impulse uh, throughout the, during the collision. So, um, once you get that far, then you reason, oh, momentum is not conserved because this condition doesn't hold. And the final thing that's left is angular momentum conservation. And I guess I <laughs> hope that it holds. <laughs> so I'm going to move on. Uh, and, you know, you can make it hold. Um, if you calculate the angular momentum about this point as the center, then whatever the pivot force is, it won't have any impact on conservation of angular momentum because it doesn't um, apply any torque. So with angular momentum, what you worry about is what is the net external torque. It's the similar condition as momentum, except uh, we're talking about torque, not force. So uh, in this setup, in the collision process, we can make it so that uh, by choosing this uh, as center of rotation, make the torque due to pivot force zero, and all other um, external forces like gravity are not going to be applying any torque uh, during the interaction either. So that's uh, kind of the hardest part, figuring out which quantity is conserved during the con uh, collision. Once you figure out the angular momentum is conserved, then the rest of the steps are a little bit easier. So we start out with, so we write down uh, conservation law equations. So this will be conservation of angular momentum equation. Uh, we choose some snapshots. We choose moments in time um, that will give us some useful equations. Um, so I have a moment in time. Uh, I guess I can actually uh, choose this as my moment in time where I have the bug moving to the right at speed of V. This is hanging at rest. So any angular momentum I have, it's going to come from this bug. Um, so let me call this a snapshot one. And I have the other snapshot where the bug will have collided with a stick and the, they'll be both rotating together. Uh, I can call them my snapshot two. So, as you are considering these two snapshots um, to write down the expressions for angular momentum, um, it helps to have a thorough uh, memory <laughs> of different expressions for angular momentum because you all have seen at least these two different expressions. You have an expression for angular momentum that's built uh, in analogy to momentum, rotational inertia times angular velocity. Uh, that's one. And that will actually be useful for snapshot two. But um, like with the snapshot one, this expression can be a bit confusing because uh, like what's my rotational inertia? What's my angular velocity for this thing that's moving horizontally? Um, and I think a more direct way to get at that is the other expression, uh, actually definition of angular momentum. That is the displacement vector R cross product with the momentum vector P. And um, for this question, we don't really have to get into the whole um, vector nature of angular momentum. All we really need is the magnitude. And for the magnitude of angular momentum, 
we can say, all right, th that's going to be RP sine theta. And uh, I can kind of group together R and sine theta to say, oh, that's my perpendicular component of the, the displacement vector, or also known as lever arm, times the magnitude of momentum. And as you look at this picture, my lever arm is basically going to be this distance. Uh, oh, which is L. That's the, you know, so this uh, direction will be the direction of my momentum. And you look at the component of this uh, displacement vector that's uh, perpendicular to momentum. That's this, that's my L. So, uh, so all of that to write down the relatively simple expression for snapshot one, where the total angular momentum of the system is the angular momentum of the bug, which is the, the perpendicular distance, L. Oh, wow. Um, I'm going to use lowercase L just so that I don't confuse myself. <laughs> Capital letter is the standard letter for angular momentum. So, um, so it'll be the lever arm, lowercase L, times the momentum, which is mv, mv. So um, that's the angular momentum in snapshot one. The stick isn't moving, so it has zero angular momentum. Conservation of angular momentum says that that should equal the angular momentum in snapshot two, uh, which should be the rotational inertia. Let me just uh, uh, give it a label, rotational inertia total, and I'll break it out into pieces in a little bit. Uh, times the angular velocity. Um, th that's how quickly it's swinging. So this is one equation. And when you are approaching physics questions, really um, what I encourage you to think through is um, think in terms of information and unknowns. Your information will be in the form of equations. I have one equation. <laughs> your unknowns will be the parameters that you don't know. So I have one equation so far. Let's see how many unknowns I have. I don't know this one. M, I don't know it, but I have a feeling it's going to cancel out. So let me just not count this as unknown. V, uh, that's given, so I know that. Uh, rotational inertia, uh, I got to write this out. Um, uh, do I, uh, you know, let me count this as a, another unknown. Um, and uh, angular velocity after the collision, um, oh, I don't know that either. So I have so far three unknowns and one equation. That means I have to look for more information. I have to uh, find more equations that will uh, give me information that I'll need. So one thing I see immediately is, okay, this total rotational inertia, I feel like I should be able to write it out. So let me just give that a try. So the total rotational inertia, that will be, um, well, that's going to be the rotational inertia of the stick plus the rotational inertia of the bug. And this is where um, you might need to look up some formulas. Uh, your textbook has table of rotational inertias. Uh, I'll just uh, write down the ones that I have memorized. Uh, for a stick, that's a uniform rod of some length L um, with some mass 10m. And when you look up the formula, the formula will say rotational inertia of a stick is one third times its mass. In this case, that will be 10m times the length of the stick uh, squared. Uh, you have to be careful about, about which point. If it's about the center, then it's a different coefficient out in front of here. Uh, if it's about an end point, that's where it's giving you the one third of the formula. So I have that plus. A bug, I'm going to treat it as a point mass. For point masses, their rotational inertia is their mass times the, the their distance from the pivot point squared, so L squared. So looking at this here, oh, I think I know everything, or I either know everything, or it's a quantity that I've already counted as an unknown. So OK, so let me just do this as my second equation. Then I still have three unknowns and two equations. I'm making a progress. I just need one more equation. And um, this is where I think we'll run into a little bit of a snag. 
because we want to express omega and you might think hmm angular velocity i can relate that with the tangential speed like uh, omega is um uh, v over l for example if i know the end point uh, is moving at some speed of v then div that divided by l will give you omega um, and this is where you could uh, uh, make some mistakes uh, like mistakenly confounding uh, confounding no conflating this v with this v uh, they are different because the speed of the bug before the collision won't be how quickly this end point moves after the collision so um um so and you do and you so you know so i could if i thought this would go somewhere i could write that omega is equal to v final over l but um, I don't think it will actually go anywhere because um, I don't have any leads on how to get this V final. So I have to kind of retract back and think more slowly <laughs> on where I could get this omega. Um, and this is where, unless you bring in some additional piece of information, you'll be stuck. Um, you do need more um, um, visualization through the process and you do kind of have to separate out this uh, interaction uh, from the collision that's one and the swing up there are two different parts in the collision was where angular momentum was conserved then we used this in the swing up is where you have to recognize oh that's a different interaction where energy will be conserved so you have to write down an expression based on energy conservation so that because in the question the information you are given is this data so that you should you need to have a plan to connect this information data to quantities that you want like omega and and it will be energy conservation so i gotta work that out all right so let me just work through conservation of energy so this is a kind of like a, a pendulum except more complicated because um, uh, because it's not a simple pendulum i have to basically think through the whole extended body of things a portion of it is simple uh, the bug a bug is being treated like a point mass so the bug portion will be simple um, but so as I'm considering this portion uh, with the bug at the end, the whole thing is swinging up at angular velocity omega. Uh, this will come to a stop at the highest uh, position it will attain. And the bug will still be stuck there. And I'm given this angle theta. And here omega will be zero. And so you think through it. Um, I think for the snapshot A, I can, um, let's see. I think I should be careful here. Because uh, what I'm looking at is, I'm looking ahead to snapshot B, where, I'll, where the you know, kinetic energy will be zero. And um, so I'll have to, look at what the potential energies are. And here the easy trap to fall into is say, okay, at A, everything is kinetic. And at B, everything is potential. So kinetic energy at A is equal to potential energy at B. And um, while there's a way to do that right, I think uh, there are so many places where people can make mistakes. I'd rather just slow down and do this properly. <laughs> Let me just... Uh, Define my reference point explicitly so that I'll be sure not to make mistakes. I am going to make my, use my pivot point as the reference. Let me just say my pivot point, that's where my height is going to be zero. And any other height references below that, I'll deal with it as a negative y. Um, so I can kind of see where the bug starts and where the bug ends up. So, you know, bug starts out from height of y is equal to minus l, and it's going to move up some distance to, and this is where you have to kind of start drawing uh, triangles. Okay, this theta here is this theta here. So this side here uh, will be cosine uh, theta 
times this hypotenuse L. So at this height, my Y will be minus L cosine theta. So, okay, and that kind of tracks the bug and I can handle that. Um, let's see. Yeah, and what you have to worry about, I don't think you can ignore it, is the changing potential energy of the of the stick. <laughs> so uh, with the stick, I will just state this without proof and use it, which is that as far as the gravitational potential energy of the stick is concerned, you can uh, use the center of mass of the stick, um, like that's where all the mass of the stick is concentrated. So this is a distance of L over 2. That's where I'll pretend the entire 10m of the stick's mass is. And it'll swing up to this position that's, uh, you know, 10 uh, L over 2 from the pivot point. So these distances will be y equals minus L over 2, uh, swinging up to y is equal to minus L over 2 times cosine theta. All right, I think I've drawn enough picture of that to write out the rest. So for conservation of energy, I like to start out with this statement. Total energy at point A is equal to total energy at point B. It ensures that I don't miss something, I don't make a mistake in writing down some terms. And when I say total energy in this context with no springs, uh, I mean the total kinetic energy plus the total potential energy in snapshot A that's going to be equal to the total kinetic energy at point B. Oh, that's going to be zero. Plus the total potential energy at point B. So, so let me just write this all out one term by one term. Um, kinetic energy at point A, I think that's actually the easiest part. I can just write this as the, the entirely rotational kinetic energy. So I'll say that's um, one half the total rotational inertia that I have up there times um, the angular velocity, this angular velocity here that we are still trying to find, squared, that's the total kinetic energy at point A, and all of this will include the bug and the stick, plus the potential energy at point A. Okay, I gotta write this separately. I have a potential energy of the bug. So the, you know, the formula for potential energy will be mgy. This is my zero reference, and I'm writing all my gravitational potential energy uh, reference to that. And just as a care, <laughs> make sure you are using the mass of the object. So bug, that has mass of n. The stick, it has mass of 10n. So potential energy in snapshot A for the bug, it'll be uh, m, small m, g times uh, minus l, that's its height. And the uh, potential energy of the stick, that'll be plus 10 mg times uh, minus l over 2. All of that's equal to um, the right hand side. Uh, kinetic energy was 0. So you, all, you only have to worry about the potential energy at point B. Um, so that'll be the potential energy of the bug coming from this position here. mg times minus l cosine theta um, plus 10 mg times minus l over 2 cosine theta for the stick. Um, all right, uh, I have that. Let's see. Um, so this is my equation 3, where I've accounted for everything. Let's see. If, so I know I have this unknown omega, which is nice because it'll connect to this new equation to the um, equations I've had before. And I don't think there are any other new unknowns. I mean, L is unknown, but that's what I'm trying to solve for. I already have that written down. And theta is a given quantity. And that's the nice thing. In this new equation, I'm connecting one of my unknowns to some of the known quantities. And I total, this is one of the unknowns that I've already counted that I actually have an expression for. So, so yeah, I think I finally have three equations and three unknowns. This is solvable. And uh, this is the step where, I guess, 
traditionally, I would have uh, gone through another 20 minutes of algebra, which will be the end of the session. Uh, let me take a shortcut. I think I can do this. Um, I'm going to use a CAG math as a proper computer algebra system. I think in previous lectures, you might have seen me use this as a basically glorified calculator. Um, a computer algebra system is more powerful than that. It, uh, uh, it can do symbolic math. So, so let me use it as a computer algebra system. So I'm going to define the variables that I'll be using, lowercase l, mass lowercase m, uh, speed of v. Um, I think I need i total defined as a symbol. Need omega. Um, let's see. I already have i total. I don't think I need those written out. Um, uh, oh, I need g, and uh, I need theta. So those are all the variables I'm gonna be using. Um, let me write out my equations. I have my equation one. L times M times V is equal to I total times Omega. I have my equation two that will be I total is equal to a one third times 10 M times L squared plus M times L squared. And my equation three, that's gonna be this last equation, one half times uh, I total times omega squared plus m times g uh, minus l. I'm deliberately not simplifying things uh, so that you can see the power of uh, computer algebra system. All of the left-hand side is equal to m times g times minus l times cosine uh, of theta. A cosine is a function, so you have to be careful about this parenthesis stuff. Um, plus m times m times g times minus L, L over two times cosine of theta. Okay, okay, so I have equation one, two, three. 13, oh yeah, yeah. sometimes I think as I was entering it, the system did its own simplification. So, um, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use this function called the solve. There's a solve function. And I'm just bringing up a documentation because I don't quite remember the syntax for um, when I want to eliminate some of the unknowns. Um, so let's see there. I guess I don't have to eliminate. I can just give them as things to solve for. Yeah, so let me do it that way. So um, what I'm going to do is solve. My system of equations, let me enter that as array. Equation one, equation two, equation three. Uh, it's got a lot of symbols defined in it. Um, I want basically three unknowns. That's my L, I total, and omega. L is really what I care about, but I need to tell it to solve for I total and omega as well so that uh, it knows which quantities are unknowns, and the system is going to assume everything else is a known quantity that I can uh, plug in the numbers for. So, they'll take a little bit of time. Uh, most of that waiting time, you know, like uh, two seconds, most of that was uh, initialization time. So, now it's giving me a few solutions, um, some of which I can kind of recognize. Oh, that's a trivial solution. I don't want that, so I'm going to ignore that. It's so giving me some other solutions. Okay, this one looks promising. Now, if this minus sign is discouraging you, look at this here. This whole quantity is negative overall. So this is a positive answer. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, that's the, my second set of answers. That's not trivially true. So let me just say sol is equal to, underscore it refers to the, um, the previous output. And I'm just going to get the second element out of that. Yeah, that's my solution. And of the solution, I really only care about the first one. So solution, the first one, it, well, not first one, sorry. That's the first one. That's what I care about. So let me plug in the numbers. Um, uh, so And you, know, you can see that the M's canceled out, as I was kind of hoping it would. I'm going to substitute in all the numbers I have. So I know G. 
that's equal to 9.8 meter per second squared. I'm just going to plug in all the numbers in basic SI units so that I don't have to worry about the unit conversion. Um, I need theta. Now, um, the question gives me degrees. Uh, this program only accepts radian units. So I have to convert 7 degrees to radians by multiplying it by pi over 180. Uh, and I need a V, which is already meters per second, a 0 0.45 meters per second. I think that's all the numbers. Oh, let me just uh, put that answer uh, through a function that gets me decimal approximation. It's trying to do this um, exact number thing, <laughs> which I don't care for. Oh, wait, well, um, was there a symbol in there? Um, okay, that's a little bit weird. Not sure why it's a claiming that's a, a symbol. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just do it this way. I'm gonna, uh, I think if I turn this into a decimal approximation, it'll just like, give me a numerical approximation. Um, I'm a little confused. Um, so, oh, I, I know why. It's because of this left hand side. That's why it's uh, uh, thinking it. So let me do it this way. And because this will do what I want it to do. Okay, good. So the length of the stick is 0 0.0533 meter. So it should be 5.33 centimeter. So, yeah, I mean, you know, because it didn't save me too much. So 5.33 didn't save me too much time, maybe save me 15 minutes of doing the algebra. But um, uh, so the, the key skill that I want you to work on building is really what we did here, you know, identifying what quantities are conserved and based on the coming up with these set of equations. Um, those are the steps that cannot be automated. There isn't a program out there that will do this in place of a trained engineer or physicist. Um, the step that we can automate is the tedious algebra. Computer algebra system can do it. Now, you know, it's uh, nice if it can also do it by hand, but you know, sometimes you get tired of doing it by hand and you want to automate it and that's perfectly fine. That's why uh, this Sage method is free. I think I've uh, uh, advertised it at the beginning of the semester. Uh, around this point in the semester is where your equations kind of get complicated. So uh, computer algebra systems really um, start, to, um, uh, start to have its value because the system of three equations um, <laughs> for three unknowns <laughs> involving squares and whatnot. It's the kind of thing that a uh, computer algebra system can do it with uh, much less pain than doing it by hand. So, wow, that one question took a long time. And the uh, hint say, yeah, which conservation laws apply? And yeah, yeah, I think it's bringing up all the points that I've already done. Um, yeah. Um, yeah.